Oh, let me speak into this mic, Mitch. This microphone does not help you at all. Uh, this, this, in fact, it, it, because I'm speaking the mic, it's, it's diffusing my voice, and you probably won't hear me. Uh, it's being used to capture uh, our presentation, as well as questions uh, for, the, uh, for the people hearing, so that this may be reproduced later. Uh, and uh, the speakers of this panel, I'll, I'll introduce myself and the speakers in a moment, will make an effort to, to speak here in the microphones. Um, and we will also, when the question period begins, we'll repeat the questions, so those will be captured as well. But we also know the questions will be asked by you, not telepathically, but orally. And uh, there's a unit up here, which is one of these universal mics. Um, we're going to ask you could come up here, it's a little bit awkward, come up here and speak into the mic, or just very loudly um, shout your question from wherever you are, and we hope that it will be picked up. Um, but in any event, we'll, we'll repeat those questions. Uh, my name is Danny Bogart. I'm from Chapman University in Orange County, California. I'm on their School of Law. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to participate here. And I, I was very uh, pleased that Tina asked me to help with this program. Uh, and this is one of the first programs, so I get to kind of relax a bit when, when this is done. I'm, I'm going to introduce the other panelists. Uh, and uh, sitting uh, to my right uh, is Helen Scott uh, from NYU. Hello, Helen. Hi. And uh, sitting next to her is Carol Hayward from Cleveland Marshall Coll College of Law. And finally, on my far, far right is David Epstein from New York Law School, the, another New York School. Um, and uh, we're all going to be uh, participating and discussing the same topic which is simulations and clinics, contract drafting, and upper level courses. Uh, we have an hour and a half, um, right? Mm -hmm. So that we thought about that, and we decided that uh, we will have an hour and 25 minutes of questions. And <laughs> no, we're going to have 15, 15 minutes per person to present, and the remaining time uh, we'll allocate to questions. Um, we would we'd like to, to move to that and have a good fruitful question period. Um, and uh, let me just tell you at the beginning that we, the panelists talked uh, for a bit uh, b uh, before we made our, created our own uh, materials, and we thought there would be some questions we would try to answer, uh, that we would each answer to give some consistency to this program, um, but we don't necessarily have to stick to script. Uh, we may focus on one thing or another as we move through, and then I'll turn it over to our first speaker. This, the questions are, what is the purpose of simulation? Uh, uh, where is the source of the simulation? Uh, what are the mechanics of the simulation? What kind of students do you get, do you look for? What are the prerequisites for the course? Uh, anonymous versus an non-anonymous grading. What is the mechanism for assessment? Uh, or anonymous versus an anonymous work product. Uh, what is the mechanism for assessment for grading? And how do we deal with ethical issues, if at all? And with that, I'm going to begin uh, with uh, David Epstein. i turn it over to you. And I will try to get to each, I mean, I get to them question by question, but they'll, they'll, all, they'll all come out right. of here eventually. As you can tell, since this is, a, well, at the moment blank, mine is kind of low tech. <laughs> you have to remember to bring this with me. You know, I've been warned. <laughs> but we'll never know what I, have, what I said here if I don't keep this with me. But uh, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, emphasizing uh, an aspect of doing something that normally a somebody who's teaching a course like uh, drafting contracts, frankly, any kind of a transactional drafting course, would, would just do on their own. Now, when you teach a class on drafting, obviously one of the things the students are going to do is a lot of drafting. It's the kind of class where much of the learning is learned by doing it, by getting feedback. And of course we have to give them something to write about, something to draft. So most of the time, I think what we do is create our own little hypotheticals. You know, we sit back and we brainstorm with ourselves and come up with some kind of a fact thing or other that, and then give them a, something to draft that's going to be based on that fact pattern that we provide, that hypothetical. I found that an alternative that seems to work well, 
the students find more interesting, that gets the students a little bit more invested in what's going on, is to use simulations uh, not just to teach how you do certain things in and of themselves. When I talk about simulations, the ones I want to talk about are the, the client interview and negotiations. And I'm talking about using them not so much to teach how to interview a client, although it's something that would, would come in, probably be the student's first opportunity to do that sort of thing. And not so much how to do a negotiation, although again, it's something we would talk about and, and something they would learn about. But it's also a useful way to provide the students with the facts that they're going to use for their drafting. In other words, to allow them to get the facts the way they would if it was real. Well, they would not simply be given a piece of paper and here's all this stuff and can you please take it and draft this particular document for us. And so as, again, as I said, what I wanted to talk about as, as an alternative to that approach is using client interviews and negotiations for that purpose. Now, you don't have to use them both. And frankly, the kind of course that I usually teach is one that is emphasizing the drafting and would probably not have an awful lot of time to concentrate on how do you do an interview, how do you do a negotiation. Although I've done that kind of class, it's not really what, what I have in mind here. So the first thing you would have to decide is whether you even would want to use both. And it's the kind of decision that you that have to make kind of early because it affects the way you do these things. Uh, if you have a, a client interview and a negotiation, they're going to feed into <coughs> one. For one thing, it means that you're going to have to have more than one client because you're going to have to have something to negotiate. You're going to have to have two sides. So unless you bring somebody in who's got some kind of a schizophrenic problem, you need at least <laughs> two people to make believe clients in order to provide the facts. And then that just feeds kind of nicely into the negotiation and, and you hold the negotiation. If you're not going to have a negotiation, well then it may not be worth the trouble of having more than one and you may just decide to make the topic of the actual drafting, something that can be done without two sides. In other words, uh, you're representing a landlord and creating some kind of a form lease, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, same is true with negotiation. If you don't have a client thing beforehand, you're going to have to create some facts just for the negotiation. Otherwise, the facts would already have been produced as a result of the client interviews. Starting with the client interview, and I'll mention, you know, I'll touch on different aspects of it as they apply to, you know, are you going to have a negotiation as well. Uh, first of all, obviously you do have to pick a topic like you, did with, like you would with anything. And I found that actually you don't write less on your own, you actually end up writing more. And again, this is very low tech, but it's just, and it, it's, in, it's in the handout, and I'm sure on the, the CD. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that I generally prepare for that kind of class. Long background materials. In this particular instance, we did a problem where a couple of people were involved in a uh, prep course for college applications. One person had started the business. They had brought somebody in as a as someone to teach, had never particularly resolved their exact duties and relationships to what they were doing, and it turned into a fight. Are we partners? Are we employer-employee? Are we independent contractor and contractor? Uh, it, it turned into a thing, at least in this make-believe little world, and actually turned into a thing. But in order to put something like that together, what I ended up doing was preparing, I did this along with uh, Professor Post at Toro Law School, where I've also taught on occasion, pages of background materials that we would give to the client, because they're obviously not real clients, 
that they would use to be able to participate in the interview, to be able to answer whatever questions that they were asked as part of the interview. You have to decide how much detail you want, how much imagination do you want to allow your uh, make-believe clients to have. How much, if you know them, and it's a good idea to know who you're using as, to stand in as clients, how much imagination do they have? Uh, how much time, if you give them something that's very detailed, will they spend learning this background stuff? You also have to decide whether or not you can have more than one possible result come of these interviews. For example, just taking the particular hypothetical here, let's say that one client is the person who started this test prep business. They interview him and they start talking about, well, what kind of a business would you like this to be, what would you like the relationship to be? And let's say he decides the best relationship, you know, basing also on what's already there, is an employer. Well, if you've decided that the class has to learn how to write a partnership agreement, this is not going to work. <coughs> so you have to decide, do you particularly care what kind of a document is going to result from this initial, nego this initial interview? Is it okay with you that it's an employment agreement, or must it be a partnership agreement, or can it be an independent contract agreement? So you have to make that kind of decision as much here as you would if you were just giving a hypothetical that you wrote up yourself. You also have to find people who will act as clients. Obviously, unless this is a clinic of some sort, these are not real clients. These are people who are essentially actors. Sometimes you can actually get an actor, uh, particularly if you're one of the advantages I've had of being in New York, because it's not terribly difficult to find unemployed <laughs> actors uh, who will, given the budget that we have to spend, work for what we can pay them, which is nothing. Uh, and I've had that work and actually found that it, I had a lot less trouble getting people than I thought I would. One of the people I got kind of scared the hell out of me because he was an elderly, retired English teacher. Very nice man, worked very, very hard, and halfway through his interview I discovered that he had been my high school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just considerably too weird, to, the world's too small, and since he was really old, it didn't exactly make me feel like a kid. But that's, that's one solution. And again, if you can't pay them, and I think that will often be the case, you have to make sure that they're willing to be prepared, that they will read the materials that, that you gave them. My old English teacher did. One of the other people I brought in did not. It's, it's something that you have to consider. Uh, sometimes you can use your friends, colleagues, or just well, don't necessarily have to be lawyers, because they probably aren't supposed to be lawyers as clients. But if you do want to get people in who you sort of know professionally, most of the time that's probably what they're going to be. And I guess it gives them uh, some notion of, of what it is that's, that's going on. You can also use students. Now, they could be students from the class, or they could just be other students from the school. There are obvious problems with using students from the class. You obviously have to have more than one set of negotiations going. Some students would be preparing things that others didn't. Uh, so if you're going to use students, probably students not in the class. Frankly, I found the, the actor's model uh, does seem to work the best. You do have to structure this thing as well. And again, in, in part, that will be affected by how big's the class. Are you going to have a negotiation afterwards? So how many sets of interviews do you have to have? Uh, I almost always have two. And that itself does create certain difficulties. For example, obviously, in the real world, when client A is being interviewed, the adversary is not being interviewed while client A's lawyers are sitting there. So if we're doing this in a classroom, does that mean that half the students can't be there? 
during one set of interview. To some extent, I think it does mean that. But this can go on for a while. I think with any interview, you probably want to tape the interview. You probably want to talk a little bit about the interview to give some feedback. I think there's a limit to how long you can go and have only half of the class present. At some point, you're simply not providing the number, the amount of time that the student's supposed to be in class unless you've got this urge to go double yourself for each one, which is okay for a while, but I think after a while it can get a little difficult. You probably want panels of students interviewing each time, unless it's a very small class. You have to decide how you want to set that up. Uh, do you just pick them? Do they volunteer for a panel? And you do want a certain amount of preparation beforehand. You do want to talk a little bit about interviewing, not the way you would if this was a class that was emphasizing that kind of skill. Here it's kind of a secondary sort of skill with another purpose in mind. But you do want to talk about it a little bit beforehand. Uh, as I said, you probably want to record it. I think one of the most effective ways of having, having people learn about what they're doing is, is to let them see what it is that they're doing later on. You do want to give them some feedback. Uh, it does raise a question as to whether or not you want to actually grade the simulation, the client interview. I always find that kind of a tough one. I've, I've done it with grading, without grading. I've never had a class so small that I could only have one or two people on the side at a time. And I, I have found it kind of difficult to grade if you've got, say, five people on a side interviewing someone at once. I find the interview goes reasonably well, better than I would have expected. But it is so hard, at least I've found it, to grade those people individually. Some person, one of the people just may be a lot more aggressive. It won't necessarily be brighter, as we all know from some of our classes, the ones who talk the most don't have to be the ones who particularly know the most. Uh, so what I've done when I do grade is to grade them all at one time. Uh, and, and that seems, when I, when I do grade, I think that works better than uh, <coughs> trying to grade them individually, sometimes I won't grade them at all. As far as the negotiation, it's a lot easier to set up, I think, than... Well, I've got my own little sample. It's easier to set up, I think, than the interview. For one thing, you don't need actors or anything else. You can do one of two things. If you have both the <coughs> interview and the negotiation, the negotiation just picks up where the interview left off. The interviews will establish what the facts are, you will have the two different sides, and then the two sides will negotiate, and they will base what they write on the negotiation. The other approach, if you don't want to have the interview, is to give them what I have here, which is very basic and a lot shorter than what I have for an interview, a very basic fact pattern. They read it, they talk about it, they meet in the te teams that they've been assigned to, and then they, give the, they do the negotiation and draft whatever product they negotiate. Well, if, um, if, if David's presentation was low tech, mine is no tech. <laughs> um, I'm just going to talk. Uh, and I'm going to talk about two things. The uh, uh, most detailed part of my remarks has to do with the course uh, that I designed, that I no longer teach. Um, and I designed 15 years ago, which in the history of this kind of teaching uh, was in the antediluvian age, <laughs> when I was much braver and probably also more foolish, or at least less savvy, um, because I felt that this was a gap in our curriculum, that students were not getting this kind of uh, thinking, teaching, or studying outside of our clinical, uh, the, se the seminar part of our clinical program, which as many of you know, NYU has a very highly regarded clinical program, but at that time, and until last semester, was entirely litigation uh, oriented. So I thought there was a real gap in our transactional <coughs> education. 
The course was called Business Transactions Planning, because who could come up with a name? Um, and the syllabus for the course is actually available on the, here's my plug, the Kaufman Foundation uh, website, kaufman.org slash elaw, uh, free access to all academics. Um, there's a flyer there if you're interested in joining. The goals and the purpose of the course were really uh, to focus on negotiation and drafting. It was not intended to be a substantive law course. Uh, it was intended really to be focused on those particular skills. Um, I made a number of decisions in connection with the course which I probably would make differently now. Uh, there were things I didn't realize were going on until they were actually happening. Uh, for example, uh, teamwork and, and uh, how the students worked in teams, how you evaluate their teamwork, um, something which business schools tend to do a lot better than law schools do, but seem to have uh, tremendous values uh, on its own, of which I was not then aware. Uh, it was an entrepreneurially geared course, so the simulation that I used was of a startup business. Uh, it was a business that I knew well, uh, having had lots of connections to this business, and ultimately I would have to say that much of the value of my connection to this business ended up being in the classroom materials that resulted rather than in the investment that we had actually made. <laughs> company, which no longer exists, but it was a great company at the time. So, um, so I reverse engineered uh, this company. I had access to all of its papers and uh, all of its business plans in various stages, all of its placement memoranda, a lot of, as much information as I could possibly ask for. Um, just as a footnote, I have uh, started exploring another business uh, to use as a model, and I have found people to be remarkably forthcoming and willing uh, to, <coughs> to let their businesses be used, even though uh, it requires the disclosure of an awful lot of material. The reverse engineering was uh, pretty dramatic, pretty, dra pretty drastic. Um, I wanted to uh, cut out First of all, all issues in which I have no expertise, which is really a lot of them, maybe even most of them. Uh, no real estate, no intellectual property, um, no tech. I mean, I don't know, you know, what I knew a little bit. Um, and the students had to form, end up forming a corporation because that's all I was prepared to deal with um, at the time. Um, and so I put real limitations around the material. And one of the things I learned from designing and then teaching the simulation several times was, of course, as we all learn in all of our courses, less is more. Uh, there's so much there that even cutting it back in the ways I did, which was frustrating to some of the students who were technology types and so forth, uh, there ended up being much more richness and material that I could get to or explore with the students, even with these uh, limitations. The class was designed on a sort of a two-track system. The students registered for three hours. Um, two of those were in-class hours, and one was an out-of-class hour. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, upper-class students have remarkably complicated schedules, and no one student has the same schedule as any other student. So arranging for them to be able to meet outside of class, to conduct negotiations, to work with each other, was phenomenally logistically Hard. And so adding this third hour, which was not an in-class hour, uh, facilitated it and also made it impossible for students to say, I'm sorry, I'm not available at that time, I'm okay. Um, and ended up being extremely helpful. The course was also structured in uh, two pieces, and so the students were on two different teams. I had two versions of the simulation, uh, one involving three characters and one involving four depending on how many students signed up for the course, because I had to have a number that was either divisible by three or divisible by four, but I was ready to go either way. Um, and it ended up being four. The visionary, the chief technology officer, the financial person, um, and the investor. Although each was bringing more than one talent to the table, those were their principal roles. Um, and so at the beginning, the students met in teams, each representing a particular character. All the founders, lawyers met, all the uh, technology persons, lawyers met. 
Um, and uh, they were devising a strategy for the formation of the company. And each one of those lawyers would go off and negotiate with the other characters, a lawyer from the other character group. So if there were 16 students, there'd be four lawyers representing the founder, and each of those lawyers would negotiate against <coughs> one lawyer for the technology person, one lawyer for the finance person, and one lawyer for the investor. Um, in all cases, I had given them background information on the clients, including some secret facts, which remarkably stay secret. Um, and I acted as liaison. I didn't choose to go the actor route, which I had thought about, and some of my clinical colleagues had used successfully. I simply said uh, that I would relay all questions to the clients and uh, their responses, which I did. And I had thick binders of printed out emails explaining all the personal quirks that the different students came up with. Um, and so that part of the course was part one, the negotiation and drafting of formation documents. How did the students decide what each person's contribution was going to be, how much it was going to be worth, what did the papers look like, um, and uh, they had to draft a, more, more often than not, there was one exception, but they were to draft, uh, ended up drafting a shareholders agreement, a uh, certificate of incorporation, and a set of bylaws. And those were really the, the formation documents. In the, the last third of the semester, because that took much longer than I had originally anticipated the first time through, so I split it differently. In the last third of the semester, the students formed teams of one lawyer representing each client, and they, the four of those, now represented the company. And the company was uh, in negotiations with a venture capitalist, an outside investor, for the firm's first outside investment. So they now were in different teams than they had been before. Uh, I created a canned term sheet that supposedly had been sent in by the investor, which was full of onerous and horrible things. <laughs> um, and their job was to um, plan the negotiation of this term sheet, figure out what arguments they were going to make, how it was going to go. Um, and then they were to suit up and go off to the investor's office. For this purpose, I recruited alumni. And I want to come back to the use of alumni in these circumstances for a couple of different reasons who were thrilled, <laughs> couldn't have been happier to have these students come to their offices and uh, do this negotiation. And they, I told them they could, uh, if, if they would, and they all did, uh, do a negotiation for a couple of hours and then break out and roll and tell the students, give the students some feedback and uh, talk about tactics. And, uh, and these were uniformly valuable experiences. Uh, for The students raved about them and so did the outside investors. When it came to materials, there were sort of none, as Tina mentioned. Certainly 15 years ago, there was very little. There was some, but it was scattered. Um, and I didn't want the students to have to purchase all these different books to read a chapter here or a chapter there. So I created a library. Um, I bought a couple of copies of each of the books I was going to use, and I think there were five or six of them. And I made them available to the students in the library. This was before the days of all this uh, electronic access, so they were literally on reserve in the library. And I created libraries of forms, form documents, that I thought they would uh, probably want to use. And they did make extensive use of them. I also used, particularly in the classroom, a number of business school case studies to demonstrate some of the things that I was talking about. Some of the theories of negotiation, some valuation issues, um, and one international cross-border negotiation problem. And I also want to come back to those uh, case studies. I had students who were both JDs and LLMs, which gave me an excellent opportunity um, in, to explore some of these cross-cultural and cross-border issues. They didn't come up often, but they, when they came up, they came up powerfully. <coughs> there was one class in which one of the teams virtually fell apart over a cultural misunderstanding that had to do with humor. Um, and it was a tremendous experience for all of the students for us to talk <coughs> about how this had happened. The, uh, the US student, the US-based student, tried to diffuse the situation, which had arisen from an offhand joking comment, by using more humor. And the European student from Spain 
who was a ex ex very proud lawyer, uh, reacted worse and worse, rather than better and better. He was very formal, his training had been different. It was really a very interesting opportunity. That was a fortunate result of the student body at NYU, which contains quite a few uh, foreign LLM students. The deliverables for the course were uh, weekly reflective memos. Um, and they were instructed as to what I wanted them to talk about, what surprised them, what didn't surprise them over the prior week, their inter-team, intra-team uh, workings, dealings with each other. Um, I have been using in the courses I've been teaching now a much more uh, rigorous uh, evaluation sheet for team projects, which I've developed with a co-teacher from the business school. But these were just reflective memos. Very valuable, very, very useful. Right? They were anonymous, completely anonymous, and confidential, anonymous to the other students. And, um, and I really got a good sense of what was going on. They had to submit their formation documents, which were group projects, but generally one student or other would take the leading oar on the documents, and uh, they had to tell me that. Um, the revised term sheet that they produced after their negotiation with the investor, in one case not revised at all, <laughs> because the investor <laughs> refused. And afterwards said, I'm giving you a real world experience. No, I will not negotiate that. No, I will not. So, the money or nothing. It was, that was very interesting. Um, and a closing list. Uh, those were their, uh, their written deliverables. In addition, there were several points in the semester where they had to present uh, as a team present the structure they had come up with for the formation, why they had structured the corporation, why did this corporation have 17 classes of stock and this other corporation only had one. And uh, So they had to present and uh, critique each other. Um, and they also had to present the results of their negotiation with the investor. Um, and each of the student groups would do the presentation and they would critique each other and that. Uh, so all of these went into the grading, went into the assessment. Uh, and I found I was able to really identify each student's performance from a baseline at the beginning of the semester, really up to the uh, to the end. So, um, a couple of points uh, just about the course. I stopped teaching it because the simulation went way out of date, and in an entrepreneurial setting, that mattered a lot. The business model made no sense anymore, um, and so I'm looking for something that's more durable, I think, but. Never know. As the economy moves, so goes entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, the business school case studies were a real find, and I continue to use them, in part because they forget all about law and lawyers. They pay no attention to what a lawyer would be looking at in, uh, in the transaction they're discussing, which makes them excellent teaching vehicles for law, for law schools and lawyers. One of my favorite ones. Um, has to do with uh, a lawyer giving advice in the middle of a negotiation who is conflicted up one side and down the other. And this, the, the case study pays no attention to this whatsoever. It doesn't <laughs> even mention it, not at all. So those are kind of a secret source for us, um, not an unintentional but very rich and useful source. And they're easy to find uh, by subject matter, by, uh, by substantive area. Um, and I just want to say a few words of, about what I'm doing now, which is moved to a very different kind of model. And I feel actually quite privileged in, uh, in what's going on at NYU now. Um, I had something called the Jacobson Leadership Program in Law and Business. This is a program that is focused on primarily interdisciplinary transactions-based courses with our business school. And uh, Tony and Eric are going to be talking about interdisciplinary courses in the next session. When I designed the simulation course, Business Transactions Planning, I thought I was riding the crest of a wave. My colleagues all thought I was paddling around in some pond in the, in the back hills. Now, of course, transactional, institutionally transactional teaching has become uh, a very hot button, um, and schools are increasingly interested in it. Which brings me back to the alumni. My program benefits uh, from the commitment of both deans, the law school dean and the business school dean, to make it work. Obviously critical and very important 
uh, to getting the cooperation and the <coughs> curricular uh, participation and so forth. But key to all of this was the alumni. To the extent, and other people have confirmed this from other schools, the alumni love, love, love to get involved. And deans who love, love, love to raise money love, love, love alumni who are interested in what's going on at the school. So I would say another secret weapon for people who are looking to increase transactional teaching at their law schools is to reach out to the alumni population. That will enhance the, um, the institutional commitment and, uh, and make the road just a, a lot easier. Hi, did everybody get a copy of the handouts? Because they're down here, all right? So we are giving out paper copies. I want to make sure that people know that we were doing that. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm really not high touch, um, even though I have a PowerPoint. <coughs> I teach in a clinic, and it's a live client clinic. I am the only full time transactional person at my law school. And in my clinic, we do some fairly sophisticated transactions. Um, kind of my bias in some ways, when I came out of law school, I went into law school thinking I would be an MA lawyer. I had been a securities regulator and traveled around the country looking at firms' trading records. So I really thought I'd be an M&A lawyer. And then when I got to law school, the only thing people talked about was litigation. So I ended up going to a litigation firm and being very unhappy for six years until I found my way back to transactional lawyering. So I've done transactional law for around 11 years now, and I've been teaching for about seven. Um, my clinic, we represent nonprofit tax exempt organizations that engage in real estate, community development, and economic development. Some of them include Greater Cleveland Habitat for Humanity, Caramu House in Cleveland, which is a historic black theater that does all kinds of community work. Um, we provide advice concerning real estate, corporate governance, and tax issues. Um, we actually serve as general counsel to some of our organizations that are fairly large. Um, as far as representative matters, we can do anything from draft to code of regulations for a client to about a year and a half ago, I finished building a $5.1 million Silver Lead Certified Community Center that had taken the students I three years to finish. We literally assembled the land, negotiated the construction contracts, um, handled the prevailing wage dispute in the middle, handled a dispute with our local utility by parking our construction trucks over their gas lines so they wouldn't rip up our driveway. Um, so the students learn a lot in that process. Um, we have generally students sign up for a minimum of two semesters, sometimes three. We actually prefer three. I like to have students start my clinic in the second semester of their second year because I found that if they wait till the fall of their third, they're already checking out mentally. They're thinking about the bar exam. So the best time for me to get them is that second semester of their second year. They attend one class per week, which is 75 minutes. I teach the first semester class. Um, and then they also have a personal supervision meeting that they have to attend with one of the supervising attorneys. There's two clinical professors who teach, so be one of us. Um, the reason I do simulations are to fulfill these goals in the first semester. I want to introduce the students to law that governs most of our clients' activities, real estate laws and transactions nonprofit, um, tax exempt organization laws and how that affects our clients and a lot of corporate governance, plain old business law advice. Usually when they get to me, they are completely adrift um, as far as actually practicing. And a lot of that is because so much of the first year and a half and two years is spent in a litigation context. Um, I want to explore the differences between transactional attorneys and litigators. I used to be a litigator, I'm now a transactional attorney. I think I'm uniquely qualified to talk about how there's different viewpoints and different ways of doing things. And I want to assist them to identify and develop what knowledge and skills they need as a transactional attorney. I am very explicit in my class. One of the things I'm very explicit about is uh, litigators look at historical facts and apply rules of law to persuade a third party decision maker. That is not what transactional attorneys do. We take this funnel or this inverted pyramid of law and we decide how we can lawfully accomplish our client's goals within the framework of those laws. 
and I literally draw that inverted pyramid on the board. And I have federal law, federal case law, interpreting federal law, international law, so that they can see how all those laws filter down what our clients can do. Um, the source of the simulations, I kind of get them from all over. There's three that I use currently in your materials. I get them from past client questions. The first simulation was a question I got from a client, and it actually teaches the students really well about precise reading of statutes. Because there's a provision in Ohio law that as far as corporate um, transactional and board work, if you're going to do um, a meeting and writing, you're going to do an action and writing, it's got to be unanimous. Okay? And it's amazing how many students don't get that, and we learn about precise reading in that first simulation. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, famous drafting errors. Ken Adams has got a terrific website about drafting. And look on there, he often discusses some famous drafting errors. You'll see some of those in the third simulation. Um, skills needed. I think that there are some skills that are needed, and my, like if I had to choose my top three, I would say that transactional attorneys need to assess and learn what they don't know. First they need to figure out what they don't know, then they need to go out and learn it. They then need to read with precision, track with precision, and then they need to do those five things that Tina talked about, controlling risk. It's, she wrote a great article about it. It's five different things, controlling risk, um, thinking about standards of behavior in contracts, and also adding value by talking about money terms. Um, they also need to, I look at the source of the simulations as the laws that affect our clients' transactions. The first simulation is nonprofit corporate governance in Ohio. And then concepts of self-regulated learning formative assessment. I'm kind of new into getting into learning theory, but it makes a lot of sense, and I've seen students respond in a different way when I stopped being the traditional law professor that I had when I was in law school 17 or 18 years ago, and now. So I'll talk about those real briefly. Um, Self-regulated learners shape the learning process by deliberately choosing strategies and monitoring what they're doing. And I think successful practitioners do that, they just don't know that's what it's called. So if we had to think about what a self-regulated learner is, we would say that they're learners who observe what they do and how they do it, they evaluate what they do and how they do it, and they also react to whether something works and doesn't. Okay? So when I go through and we go through our simulations in class and we spend an entire class discussion on um, the process of them reaching an answer and the actual answer they reach, we talk a lot about what strategy they use to get an answer. And it's really interesting to see every semester I'll get one student who will immediately pop down Lexis and search case law for an answer there's no answer to in case law. Because again, transactional attorneys work very differently than litigators. Um, <coughs> I also use form of assessment by the group. So we'll talk about the mechanics in a minute, but I have everyone send me in word files their answers to the simulations. I then take all those word files and I accumulate them into one large file and I take off their names and I send them back with discussion questions far ahead of class. And I expect them to read and be prepared to discuss. Some of the things we then discuss in class is where did you start looking for the answer? Um, we also will talk about what worked to find an answer. Did you Google? Did you go look at a form? Did you look at a secondary source to try and case law? So the great thing about using that technique is that real attorneys see each other's work all the time. It's how we learn. I know in Cleveland who the really terrific real estate and finance attorneys are by their work because I get their documents. There are a couple, there's one lady, Thompson Hine, has, does beautiful work. I mean, the, her contracts are just gorgeous. They're short, they're to the point, they're understandable. They say what they mean to say. Um, so you need to get students starting to, to engage in that process because really before then in law school, they usually just receive an exam at the end and they haven't seen other people's exam answers. So they don't know where they fall with their peers. So when they get those packet of answers, that's got everyone's answer, they can tell where they fall within their peers, which is often a pretty strong motivating force in them kicking themselves more into gear. Um, that also helps with grading. 
So if you get a student who really has not performed as well as other people, they see in the results just in these simulations that their performance has not been as good. All right. So then when we also do the assessment, we also talk about what self-regulating learning techniques they used. What strategies did they think about? How did they plan to do their work? And all of those other kind of backroom kind of thinking thought processes that, that a lot of us don't think deliberately, deliberately think with, about with deliberation. <laughs> After lunch. <laughs> okay, so all of them are designed so they don't use case law, because I don't want us to go down the path of case law, because I think that's a bad thing when I'm trying to teach them the difference between litigators and um, transaction lawyers. All of them are given after some class discussion. I just don't drop something they've never heard about before. Um, they're distributed anonymously, the answers. Students, by the second simulation, immediately will start saying, that's my answer, and confessing if they screw something up. <laughs> Um, because it really builds a level of trust in the classroom, too. Um, all, of the, all of the simulations really try to teach the students to be self-regulated and provide formative assessment. And we do that in class. I think it's really important. It's also important for the students to see how I solve a problem versus how the students solve a problem. Because they think they really learn from that. Where do I go first versus where do they go? Um, so the focus is always not on the end result, the answer that they hand in, but on the process because they can always improve the process. Uh, the first simulation that's in your materials um, show the transactional litigation attorneys work differently. Um, they're right here, you have this PowerPoint. I think the, the great thing about that first one is it lets me do an immediate read of their skills. They get it the first day of class and they have to turn it in by the next week. So I can immediately see who's in real trouble. The goals of the second simulation, which is a little different, the first simulation deals with corporate governance questions, which are straight from the revised code in Ohio. The second simulation deals with a real estate contract. And it asks them to evaluate a real estate contract that one of our clients has used before. And actually, it's an old draft that I've made worse from our local bar association <laughs> by taking out some things. But it also really shows them how attorneys use forms to learn. Um, a lot of transactional attorneys use past forms or other people's forms to learn. It's how I learn a lot and check myself. We also demonstrate how attorneys assess forms. One of my favorite ways to assess a form is to see, you know, one, is it state specific? Two, if it's not state specific and I don't know what its origin, does it mention laws that I know apply in Ohio? And then my bugaboo, does it use shall consistently and appropriately? Because that drives me nuts. All right, but there are ways that we talk about literally about how you assess forms as an attorney, whether you should use something. Um, and it emphasizes again the importance of reading with precision. I don't think our students get the fact of how important it is to read with precision. And it begins that second simulation to teach them the importance of drafting with precision. And we always learn about how it's okay to be vague, but it's not okay to be ambiguous. All right, and the goals of the third simulation, which is a tougher simulation, if you'll look in the, in the packet, are again to emphasize the importance of drafting for precision, to compare the strategies and skills used to evaluate forms with those needed to review a draft from opposing counsel. So when you get a draft from opposing counsel, how do you review it? If it's an area you've never been in. If it's an area you've never been in, you might want to go get another form that someone else has used. What's here? What's missing? Demonstrate by how attorneys can add value by suggesting different terms concerning compensation. In the simulation, for instance, compensation is tied to certain <coughs> development points that are mandated by our city codes. So they learn that municipal laws often affect what their clients do um, and how laws, again, will impact the transactions. We were, talk we were supposed to talk about quickly, I think, how much time do we have left? One minute. Okay, <laughs> um, about how we deal with ethics. I deal with ethics from the moment they come in the room until they leave, which is maybe two or three semesters later. Um, I talked about, there's a kind of a famous case, and I should have gotten you the site, but it involved the law firm in Ohio, and it was a federal criminal case. My old firm defended one of the lawyers in the case. 
and it was about a lawyer making a conclusion that a transaction could be done a certain way, and he was very wrong. And he ended up being charged with more than 200 counts of mail fraud, wire fraud, and money laundering. But we talk about that the very first day when I talk about the funnel, um, creating what your clients can do, the funnel of loss, federal law, all those things that can limit what your clients do. We also talk about such difficult things as I once had an attorney in a transaction with a screamer. And many of the students would sit, I would put him on speakerphone. And I thought, you know what, sorry. I would put him on speakerphone and he would just scream and scream and scream. And the students would be so shocked. And we would then talk about how I handled that scream and whether I should have done things differently. Um, so every day, because we're a live client clinic, because we do a lot of transactions, we deal with ethical issues. So those are just something we always do. All right, well, I guess I'm the last. Let me begin by saying that I, I don't teach ethics because I don't believe in them. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe I do somewhat in grading, but otherwise. Uh, no, I, I'm going to talk to you about my commercial leasing. I guess this is being recorded, so that's a bad thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> never, never nominated for the court, you know. It'll be we'll edit somewhere. it out of the court. Yeah, it'll be, <laughs> it'll be it. Um, I'm going to talk to you about my commercial leasing course. And uh, this is a, a course I've been teaching uh, for a very long time. Uh, this is my 20th year in teaching. I ask uh, as my, you know, my dream elective uh, when I was given an opportunity early in teaching to begin teaching this class. Um, actually, there's a course, a simulation course, that was created by Lynn LaPucky called the Debtor-Creditor Game, which was a really innovative program, uh, which he didn't, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, keep up. It was a simulation that was on, which was uh, computer-based, PC-based, uh, if you were teaching bankruptcy, and when he ceased keeping that date, I started the leasing course. Um, uh, I, I, there are a lot of ways to approach this, and I want to give us enough time to have questions and answers. But uh, what I'll do is go through some of these questions that we've generated uh, to provide some consistency. Uh, let me tell you the goal, or goals, that is, of the course for me. First of all, I have a huge, huge chip on my shoulder. Um, it amazes me that, uh, that commercial leasing, which comprises a significant portion of what real property and real estate lawyers do across the country and is millions upon millions of dollars in generated billables for lawyers uh, is barely taught at law schools, where many schools maintain huge staffs of intellectual property lawyers, God bless them, when only a small number of those students will go on to practice in that area. But I guarantee you out of my first year property course, many of those students will negotiate commercial leases at some point during the course of their careers. I can't explain its absence. I will tell you that the American College of Real Estate Lawyers at its annual meeting devotes 30 or 40% of its time to discussion of leasing topics. I, I, because I was one of, and I'll admit this now, two people who worked for uh, the, MBR, uh, the, the MBRE as an individual who saw the real estate and real property questions before each test administration and the answers. Uh, leasing was on the exam. Future interest and the dog and the hounds, narrow, no, never. <laughs> uh, this is also an opportunity to expose students to transactional practice in a neatly compact area. One of the things you've been hearing as, the, as my colleagues have been speaking is that transactions, as you know, is document driven. And that's the problem for us in my mind. You see, the, pro a, we can, the litigation attorneys and, uh, can divide their materials up by subject matter and topic area, but our practices are document driven. So if you are teaching a mergers and acquisitions course, my God, you've got a lot of documents. Well, in the commercial leasing area, although there are many documents, there's still primarily one. I can expose them, the students, to what they need to know about transactional practice using one document. That's a real advantage. The next goal I have uh, is to make the connection for them, but for them being the students, between the idea that there's no such thing as a good, skilled lawyer and a lawyer who does not understand the substantive law. It's a misnomer. It's, 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 it's in a, it, it, is, it is something that's in the ethos of some law schools, many law schools, and it's wrong. It is generated by, a, a, in a, many ways I won't go into now, I'm very biased about it. I told you I had a big chip on my shoulder, but I've written about it, so I can tell you about the article, and you can read it later. 
But even survey courses and uh, negotiations, as good as they are, because they teach you how to uh, avoid, to, to, to employ more than one strategy or style. Um, those courses, well, well, from family law one week to real estate law the next week to some litigation practice the next week, you don't really have to know a lot about the substantive law. But what I know, and what you know, is that you can't be a good commercial leasing lawyer if you don't understand the law. The last thing is they have to understand not that it's just document driven. You can't understand and negotiate and be a good lawyer unless you not understand every provision in that document. Well, I have this compact form I can work with. Now, I said that actually, actually the last goal was like the old Monty Python routine, the Spanish Inquisition, the four things, not a five. <clears throat> there is no way in law school that we can achieve this thing called mastery for our students. Very few of us, I did not achieve what I consider to be mastery as a sophisticated transactional lawyer. There are a few people in, in teaching who achieved that, but not many. But where does mastery in transactional practice come from? Well, I will tell you right now, it's the secret. It is the repetition, the, the, the <coughs> seeing the same, working in a lease transaction, but seeing multiple documents, different documents. You work in your, your real estate lawyer, for example, and you do commercial leasing, and let's say, because you're going to do landlord-tenant work, but let's say you're doing retail work. You're going to see, if you're representing a tenant, multiple mall forms. But your job is the same. Mastery comes not after the first time you've worked with it, or the second time, or the third time. It's after you've seen the sixth or seventh lease, the eighth lease, the ninth lease, all different forms. But you're looking for the same law and the same mind, the same traps. I want them to understand this, and I can do this in a commercial leasing scenario. Now, that's, those are the goals. They are the sources. Well, there are tons of sources out there. I have to tell you that when it comes time to finding commercial office forms, commercial retail forms, there's an endless supply. In my own case, and I'm, I promised Tina I wouldn't shill too much, so I will keep it to a minimum. But actually, it's, it's appropriate, because Tina was talking about books. And it is hard to get books written. They take a tremendous amount of time, and they pay nothing. <laughs> Who's your publisher? <laughs> no, no, my publisher is a wonderful publisher. Caroline, I have two, but Caroline, I can impress. But the point is, you have to get the books adopted. And what the publisher says is, show me it will be adopted, I'll give you the book. And you say, I've got a whole new area of law. You give me the book, and I'll get it adopted. The value of the book is actually a little bit different. It's one, it helps you. You've been working this course a long time. But there is nothing like writing the book that makes you refine and resolve your own problems. The second is it validates the area of law. I can now say to this school, to other schools, well, there's a book here. Our sources, we went to the ABA and got their permission to use forms in their promulgated form book. We use two forms in the book. One is their basic, what I would call, office lease. It's not tenant friendly, but it is an awful. Then we use the form which the ABA calls the killer lease. It is the most singularly obnoxious, egregious form of drafting I've ever seen. <laughs> Nothing is better as a test bed for testing students. And at the end of each chapter, it doesn't have to be a book. This is a style you can adopt. But at the end of each segment of learning, if you wish, but at the end of each chapter, we have an application. We say, how would you modify this provision, this awful killer lease provision? If this is the charge you've been given by your client, what are your concerns? <coughs> what language needs to be changed? Now that these are some of the goals that we have and the sources that we use. Or what is the simulation? Well, it's usually limited. The first thing that's awful about a simulation course is you can't have an unlimited number of students. So even if we got Tina's wish, I hear, that everybody signed up, we'd have to have a whole lot of teachers. 16 people's a lot. It's a ton of drafting and a ton of teacher critiquing. I have 16 to 20 students in my course, leasing course, divided into teams of two. It sounds like it's easy work for me. Two hour class, they routinely put into three to four hours worth of work. There are five assignments. The first three assignments are drafting assignments. Very straightforward, meaning from what I would call simple to relatively moderate. Draft an expansion right for the tenant. Draft an extension, a renewal right to the lease for the tenant. A little more difficult. Draft provision allowing the tenant the right to an accounting of the landlord's, the landlord will present a bill at the end of each year saying, here is your share of operating expenses for the building paid. So you want a right if you're the tenant. 
to look at the landlord's books and to see if he's charging the right amount. Now that the lawyer has decided where to put in the lease, how should it be written? Now that's drafting, actually, on the landlord's side. <coughs> the fourth assignment, the one which is a subject, but I'm going to keep it short. I'm going to move fast and give us some time. The fourth assignment leading up to the fifth, oh my god, they put in time. It is a review of a lease. Now here's where mastery comes in. Remember, I only, they only get a taste of it. It's the second form they see, a wholly new form. It's an industrial tenancy agreement, kind of like a lease, a commercial office lease, kind of like a retail lease, kind of like something else. They haven't seen one before. And they are given, and you'll see the instructions, I won't go over them here, they're given instructions. They represent a newbie, a, a new business. And they're told, tell your client about this lease. Because this will form the basis for your negotiation with the landlord. What are his legal rights, what are his lawyer, what are his worries, what are his priorities. They spend 15 hours writing this thing. And they'll write a 10-page letter. And then I'll say, how much were you charging? And did you think the client was going to pay you for that? That assignment is the first time they represent the tenant. And they are forced now to think about the tenant's goals. And one of the next things I've got to tell you is a goal... The sixth thing, the Spanish Inquisition, is something that rarely, rarely happens in any kind of transactions of any, in any kind of course outside of transaction based course, is the desire to force students to think about the motivations of parties. Litigation courses have a different format. We should start with contractual language. Then we should be thinking about the objective or motivations of the parties. Then terms of art. Because in every lease provision, there are terms of art that have particular meanings. And finally, and only then, do we get to kind of the substantive law, and then we should really, really mind it. All right, that fourth assignment makes them apply these things. They will review a lease on behalf of a tenant with specific goals in mind. By then, we have gone through about a third to a half of the course. So they only know about half the law they need. They have this distinct feeling by the, that they're flying by the seat of your pants. Now, I want you to remember your first two years of practice. Remember that feeling? <laughs> you don't know exactly what you're doing. So students always come to me and say the same thing. I need an example to work with. Now, in practice, you might get it, but my answer is always, no. I'm giving you nothing. Nothing. You have, and by the way, all of their work is non-anonymous. It is, it, their work is loaded online, every last piece of work, because they're told in practice there's no such thing as an anonymous exam. It's online, and then I critique it, and it takes forever. So my critique is online. The only thing that's anonymous is the grade. Now that's the fourth assignment. Now they've been forced to think about landlord's motivations and draft on the landlord's behalf. They're forced to draft the tenant's review of a lease, because that lease review letter basically is nothing more than the letter that they will be sending to a landlord. The final and fifth assignment, which I don't have time for, is a full-blown lease negotiation, where half the parties take the landlord's side, half the parties take a tenant's side, and guess what? A new lease form with a wholly new set of facts. It's a new office lease. It's an office project somewhere here in Atlanta. It was the lease form that was in use for many years, and I suspect some form or fashions around today and they're asked to review it and then turn in their work product. The grading is always on the work product. And, and one of the, there's one last objective, it's great, I keep adding to it. Maybe it's just the result. Do you know how little they leave law school with to get a job? Right, this is a very serious question I'm asking you now. Do you know what they present in terms of written product? That is, when a, when a lawyer says, what have you written? Show me your writing capability. Many of them use their first year writing samples. They have nothing. And if they have something else, they have a memo, a research memo written for a, lawyer, for a law professor who wants them to produce something like a law review article, which they will not be doing in transactional practice. My students leave with a review of a lease, which is 14 pages long. It does not matter that it's not as good as their associates perform. I have, will tell you right now, my students have gotten jobs with those things. I've gotten calls from a lawyer saying, I have never seen this. Because there's no, we didn't do it in law school. That should be a goal of what we do in here. They should, that is an end product for us. It's not just the substantive knowledge. We should be thinking about what they do from here on out. Will they get a job? And the written product is something they should lead with.
So I've been talking, I wanted to keep it, and I'm done. Now we have time for questions, but only one. Long one. <laughs> All right. And what may I ask before you begin that we've been told that you should identify yourself and your school? Bill Carney, Emory. Uh, this is Carol. Uh, I'm fascinated by the idea of throwing from the research and drafting no particular set of references to forms and guidance that they have to find this themselves. I recall when I started practice, that was pretty darn difficult. When I was in law school, it would have been impossible. Um, what do you teach them about how to search for useful materials? Um, generally, what I'll do is those first uh, first lecture, I talk about that inverted pyramid up. And I'll give them examples of what laws govern our clients' transactions. So for instance, I'll mention the fact that because we have 501c3s that are nonprofit corporations organized in Ohio, the Chapter 1702 of the Ohio Revised Code governs their activities as corporations. So some of them, if they're paying attention in class, will get that. Then they will help each other. But because lawyers on a regular basis are confronted with um, problems that we don't know what category they fall in, I want them to start getting used to it. So they'll get some hints in class on where to go, but one of the things we talk about when we go over the simulations in great detail is where they started, why they decided to start where they did, and whether it was an appropriate strategy. Because I want them coming out and actually being of some use to me in the second and third semesters, which they end up actually being. <coughs> Um, which is terrific. And part of me does this because I used to be in charge of the summer associates at my old firm. And I can tell you, every summer I used to put them in my car and drive them to the law library and teach them how to research like real lawyers, quote unquote. Um, so nobody comes in and tells you they have a tort problem. Nobody comes in and tells you that it's really 1702, the higher revised code that governs whether or not their executive committee can make a unanimous uh, written decision without being unanimous. I want them to learn how to think about what they don't know and go out and find an answer. So I give them a little bit in class, but then they're on their own. Which is fair, because that's what they're going to need to practice. I'm wondering, this, this question was particularly for Carol, but actually I'd like to hear it from, oh sorry, Joan Hemingway from the University of Tennessee. Joan, he Joan Hemingway from the University of Tennessee. That's right. Okay. Uh, exactly. They told us to repeat. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, curious about the size of each of your classes, um, and in particular in the clinical setting, what the teacher-student ratio is for you and other people that teach the class, and also in each case, whether any of you have um, particular prerequisites that you require for your classes. Um, I was thinking of it particularly during your presentation, but it strikes me it actually applies to everybody. So. Uh, I'll go first. Um, okay, sorry, just quickly before you answer the question, can okay. you repeat the question okay. into the microphone for okay. the, uh, the transcript? Thank you. <laughs> Now the question was, how many students are in each of our classes? That was the first part. And what was the second part? Uh, and the prerequisites. prerequisites in many. Requirements. And the prerequisites many. We um, have a role that we will only take eight students per professor. I can't talk today. And so there's two of us that teach in my clinic, so that's 16 um, folks that we have at any given time. We generally, if somebody's in their third semester, we, their freebie is they don't have to attend our class session. And um, we generally consider them a little less to supervise, so we'll go over the 16 when we have third semester students. There's no prerequisite. I'd like folks to take corporations um, because so much of what we do, um, really even real estate transactions, you have to do corporate resolutions to um, show who has authority to sign documents, et cetera. I like them to take that, but it's not necessary. So we don't have any prerequisites other than I will not let you take my class if you're not in, at least in your second semester or second year. Because I want them to get through that first semester of common law before they, they come to me. Yeah, but drafting contracts, <coughs> I guess the maximum we have is 20 which is a bit on the large side, but that would usually be the maximum. It's occasionally been higher, but not for a while. Uh, no prerequisites, except obviously they're taking first year contracts. Uh, I've on occasion toured a business organization's practicum simulation sort of thing. Same size, but there, you know, sort of the, the obvious prereqs. At least the students would have to have taken the basic business organization type classes like corporations. 
uh, in my uh, simulation course, uh, the maximum number of students I ever admitted was 18. Six teams of three was horrific. Um, more often it was 16, four teams of four. Uh, prerequisites included, uh, uh, necessary prerequisites for corporation and the basic income tax course. Um, but since they were admitted by permission of the instructor, I also had the opportunity to kind of add some expertise here and there among the students. Um, in the law and business courses that we now teach, since there are an equal number of law students and business students, the maximum size of those classes is 24 of each because they're also team projects. Um, <clears throat> in my commercial leasing course, it's capped at 20. Uh, sometimes it's been 20. Uh, I prefer it when it's a little bit less. Uh, they work in teams of two. Uh, the prereqs, uh, honestly, it's the, with the catalog, I think last had real estate transactions strongly recommended. Uh, but uh, because sometimes real estate and commercial leasing has been inverted in the order in which I would prefer. There have been times that I've needed to take the commercial leasing students even though they haven't had real estate, which is a little weird, but that just what happens <coughs> since I teach to real estate uh, it means that I know what they know when they get there. But that's not my preference. Real estate ought to be taught first. Right, Bryce. Uh, uh, Mike. Is that Brian Price and that was Harvard. Harvard. Okay. Uh, my question has to do with when you when you're doing drafting assignments. I, I think some of you said that you assign students to work in teams, and I'm curious how it is that you uh, make sure that each student is getting experience across the, the board and all the assignments that they're given, and then how you evaluate and uh, give them feedback on that. I'll repeat the question and we can just decide how we answer it. The question is when students work in teams creates a problem. How do we make sure that they're uh, each doing the same amount of work or getting the same experience? Is that essentially the right? right. right. Um, there, well, there are a couple of ways to deal with that issue, which is a hard issue. Um, one is to have a number of different drafting assignments or pieces of drafting assignments. Um, another which I have used uh, with successfully is to have an ongoing monitoring system, uh, which is really a reporting system by the students, anonymous reports to me on an ongoing basis. In the case of the seminar, it was a weekly basis. Um, in the courses I teach now, it's not only a reporting, it's a it's an actual grid where the students uh, put down their views of the percentage that each student is, uh, is contributing. Uh, and it's interesting that they don't always overweight themselves, and sometimes they do. But, um, and that turns out to be, on an ongoing basis, a remarkably accurate um, measure. There are some students who are going to free ride, and uh, the hope is that the assessment mechanism will reveal that and you and the students know that it will be taken into account. I mean the team projects represent a certain percentage of the grading rubric. Can I just follow up? Um, I think it was a Carol, you had mentioned that in your first assignment uh, one student may work on uh, bylaws or another student on articles. I'm not sure which which person that is, but um, if you want both students to get experience in both areas, uh, how would you address something like that? I'm not sure which which of you. I think both uh, let me let me tell you how I do it in my clinic. All the simulations are individual work product because I want to assess their skills and I want them to measure their skills against the other folks in the class and the way they do the assignment compared to the process that the other people went in. They also are doing some client work in that first semester, which oftentimes is group work or there's two or three people get the assignment together because I don't want to overwhelm them. When that happens, I have them do a group assessment of how they perform together as a group, which is often really interesting. And it really gives them a, a good glimpse of the fact that attorneys in large deals, we have to work together all the time and carve out work. Um, so they, they literally have a group assessment form that I use um, that they, it's very similar it sounds to what form she uses. If, if I can, I, I'm going to kind of take my own take, 
I think I, I come at this a little bit differently, so I'm going to add this. I, I'm actually um, unsympathetic to, to, to some degree to the students who are unhappy that they're doing more work than their colleagues. And I don't listen a lot to it. Um, uh, I give the same grade to both students, no matter whether one student does 100% and the other does zero. Um, now that may seem a little harsh, and the pedagogy may seem weak. Uh, what I'll tell you is that I put on screen, uh, on, right there at the whole class C in a small, intimate setting, the work product for these two people. And you know, one of the things you discovered in practice is that when something goes out under someone else's name, but you did it, they get in trouble, then you get in trouble. And it's amazing what an incentive that is to both parts to participate. Uh, because they are both, in a sense, labeled with the quality of that work. Um, I have found it is very difficult, personally, to assess who is really working hard. Because you hear two sides to a story every single time. Uh, one of the problems I had recently, and I, I can't say no to this because I don't really want to inquire. I guess I could. There were two people working together. It turned out later they were, you know, a couple. Three quarters way through the semester, one comes in crying and says, you know, we're breaking up. <laughs> <laughs> and I have one, the big assignment is coming up. What do I do? And I said, well, it's too late to divorce your partner, right? You know, that's your partner. You go work it out because you have a client. And uh, they did. They had a business obligation to do so, and I don't know what they're doing now. It's none of my business. <laughs> right. uh, Mark Mahali from Vermont Law School. I just want to follow on his question. When you have groups in simulations, do you allow the groups to, groups to self-form, and, and do you shuffle them? I've had problems in my land transactions, finance, and development class where I allow students to work in groups of two and three, and I notice a tendency uh, for all the smart students to want to group together and leave some of the others out. Should I, should I repeat that? It's Mark Mahali from Vermont. Yeah. And the question is, how do the groups form? Uh, do you let do them, you so, shuffle them? Do you shuffle them? Do you let them pick their partners, so to speak? Uh, <laughs> and that's a very good question. I can, I, again, I don't use group simulations, but I use group assignments, and I tell them who their group is because in a law firm, you don't get to pick your group. Um, and I, uh, I try to balance the group um, a little bit with as far as strengths and weaknesses so that there is some synergy there so we don't have all the smart students together because you're right, they do have a tendency to kind of group. And that oftentimes when they group together, there's interpersonal difficulty done um, because they may all be that A type and there may be real some personality issues. I tend to do the same thing. I won't let them group themselves. I think all kinds of things go wrong. Uh, I assign the people to groups, and I also try to make them have a certain amount of balance. Same kind of grade spread in each group if I'm near the end of the semester. The same kinds of personality spread. In other words, I won't, I'll try to make sure that I don't have all the strong personalities in one group and you know, all the shy people in another group. Now, that has some drawbacks also. You have an A type and a laid back type. You can have some, you know, the A type may dominate, but I won't let them pick their own uh, partners or group members. I've done it both ways. Um, in the simulation seminar, I formed the groups. I, had, I knew the students' backgrounds. They had to apply for the course. and. I wanted the groups to, I didn't want one group to be overweighted with people who knew a lot about finance and one group to be underweighted. Um, that raises a whole other set of interesting professional issues but I didn't want, that I didn't want to have to uh, confront as well. Um, I've also allowed students to form their own groups with, uh, with very slight constraints. That's usually in the long business courses and they don't really know each other. So the interpersonal dynamics are very minimized. Uh, when there have to be students from different populations forming teams. Uh, and to my surprise, I was really a skeptic about that. Uh, it worked out very well. Um, <clears throat> I really have jumped back and forth over the years. Each, each year that I do it, I then say, boy, I should you know, assign them next year. And then after I assign them, I say, I should have just let them pick you know, among themselves. Um, it, lately, what I have been doing uh, is allowing them to choose their partners. Um, because I've discovered, on the whole, 
uh, that they work harder when they are working with a partner that they like um, and with fewer uh, disagreements. Uh, the problem, of course, is that it's, they may pick like-minded individuals. And what you want is a kind of <coughs> rapport, but disagreement, so they learn from one another. And so I go back and forth. Um, I see weaknesses to each side and strengths, and I don't think it's ever going to be perfect, and that's a problem with simulation classes. Does the team stay the same throughout your five years? Absolutely. And you think that's important? Yeah, I actually do think it's important. Um, I mean, I, I've never tried a kind of do -si do thing to move them around, but I, I think it, it is important. They need to develop a sense of trust and understanding. So it's a very compact, intense two-hour course. Uh, yeah, thanks. Jeff Prosky, uh, Pacific McGeorge Law School. Uh, have you had concerns about plagiarism and just simply lifting uh, materials off the, off the web? How, well, and how do you really assess whether the students are drafting their own pieces or just simply lifting things off the web? I'll repeat it and I'm okay. It's Jeff Prosky from Pacific McGeorge, McGeorge right? Correct. And the question is, are these kids plagiarizing? And how do you make sure that they aren't? And how do you assess you know, that they've got their own original work? Correct. With my simulations, I'll often like, tweak them a little so that I ask maybe one different question or, or something else. And then also when we discuss them, it's hard to fake where they started and how, you know, I mean, so it's really hard for them to, to pretend that they actually did it when they didn't do it because when I ask them, so how long did it take? So how did you plan for it? Where, what were your sources? They can't answer those questions. So it, it hasn't been an issue for me. I think I've used the same combination of techniques, which is tweaking the simulation. <coughs> Uh, even though the, uh, when I taught it, we didn't have the same kind of electronic posting ability, so the documents from prior seminars were not posted. But tweaking the simulation, moving, for example, from three uh, characters to four, um, and then the presentations where they have to present what they did and explain their strategic decision making and explain the legal constraints um, and be subject to critique, it's very difficult to explain that if you have no idea what you did. So, uh, so that seems to have uh, worked. Uh, for what it's worth, um, I think this is one of the good things about simulation courses that are small in size, such as these, which is that it is actually very hard for students to plagiarize in the way you, you're, you maybe, we normally think about that in law schools. Um, you, you would be amazed at how, um, <coughs> how fundamentally flawed their first assignments are. In other words, they are so far from what it should look like as a finished product that if they're plagiarizing, I'm not sure where it came from. And uh, you can see the natural progression to the end of the semester. I suppose the day will come when I'll discover that a student found a way to take work from another student and I just didn't catch it. Uh, but but it doesn't seem to have been an issue. I've found a lot of other issues in teaching this course, but that just hasn't been the one. With my classes, I found seldom any problem with a student trying to take something that had previously been done by a student. In part because of some of the things that were, were discussed. Uh, there's always the problem, of course, of students just, you know, in drafting anything, going online or going to a form book and, and grabbing stuff. And frankly, I've never made much of a big deal about it because I've always thought it was its own punishment. You know, there's so much crap out there <laughs> that more than likely they're going to destroy themselves if they use it. And if they know how to take it and make it good, well, hey, fine. But uh, I just generally find that the worst thing they can do just for their own sakes is, is to do something like that. They end up with a bad grade. Uh, Dan Janty from Case Western in Cleveland. Um, uh, Carol and Danny, you both mentioned that you put student work online so all the other students can can see it. And I'm wondering, what, what do you do to um, make sure that they use that as a tool to assess their own, uh, assess their own work? And um, by doing it, are you concerned about limiting your ability to reuse material in future years? Well, well let me repeat, it's Dan Jaffe from Case Western. And 
asked, uh, since Carol and I both put our the student work online for students to see it, um, uh, are we worried that we're limiting our ability to use materials in future years? And what was the, I think there was a second part. Well, how, how do you enforce their, their, make sure that they actually gain something? How do we make sure they actually look at uh, other students? How do we make sure that they look at other student work? That, that's a great question. I, I'm, do you want me to go first or? You go. Okay, well, <clears throat> to me, this is the most fun part of the class. Okay, in other words, this is what the course is built for. In, in my class, because the, the drafting exercises are, to some degree, staggered throughout the semester with some fairly, I wouldn't say, they're easy to one, from my perspective, but they're hard from theirs. But the bigger projects moving toward the end of the semester. A lot of the really interesting work in class is the evaluation of their work product on screen. Okay, that's, by the last third of the semester, a good bit of our time is spent not discussing a case, although we did a lot of it. A lot of it is, is taking each student assignment one, of, one at a time. The critiques are online. I've got a copy of the critique in front of me. I've got their work, and I will highlight their work on screen, provision by provision. There's two, there's two meanings to what you just wrote, two possible readings. Don't you see that? And now what are you going to do? What happens, you know, whenever, whenever there's another possible reading, the other side is going to find it, you know? So, I, from my perspective, the, the, the idea that uh, they wouldn't be taking um, a lesson away from their own work or from some other student's work, I'm not worried about it. This is the most engaging part for them. Um, and what's clear, one of the things I do is I ask students before they come to class to read the work of the other teams. And I will be asking students, almost like we're talking about cases of first year property, about other students' work. I mean, I'll say, what did you think of the so-and-so teams? You know, their answer here, their approach was to do Y, but you did X. <coughs> and we'll put both on screen at the same time. So I, mean, I, I don't, to me, that's, in the other part of it, which is that the work is out there, there's an honor code requirement that they not share this work with anybody, that they not share their, the assignments. When I say it's up, it's up on twin, but it's there for a limited period of time, and their rights to see the, those assignments are over. Obviously, they could print out everything they have and keep it and, and demonstrate it to other folks. But there is an honor code requirement that they not share anything with anybody. And from time to time, I've created new assignments. Um, between the two, it works for me. What I do is I slightly tweak um, to control for that. Maybe I'll ask some different questions. And then the class discussion is the most valuable part of the simulation in some ways. Because that's when we talk about the process for them engaging creative problem solving. And we, we spend a lot of time, and I think it's probably the best part of the simulation. And so I, I think that's how you deal with it. Linda Crane, I'm uh, at John Marshall Law School in Chicago. Do any of you teach drafting exercises as a part of a course that's not dedicated to drafting, like in, a, uh, in your contracts class or payment systems or classes where clearly you're really teaching uh, students how to draft, uh, but by looking at documents that failed, you know, in, in the case book. So um, I, I know that you also teach the drafting course and that, that's what the program is about, but do you have experience <coughs> actually doing this in a doctrinal course and how do you actually manage the time problem? Let me repeat, it's Linda Crane from John Marshall in Chicago, and Linda asked uh, whether we teach contract drafting in other classes, and other courses. Well, I try to do some of it in con contracts, and I have to admit, not very well um, because of the size of the class. Um, and basically what I have them do is critique drafts of a couple of clauses. Their favorite is the covenant not to compete, uh, which is a mess, and they're all over it. Uh, but because of the size of the class, it's hard for me to have small teams or individualized. But I do use my, uh, my TAs in contracts to do, uh, among other things, they do a variety of problems with the students. And, and one of them is based on drafting. And their job is to um, do line by line uh, critiques of their students' work product and to hold uh, sessions with the students to go over it. So, uh, it's a that's a big compromise way of uh, trying to do some of it at least. 
Well, uh, Sam Jackson, Georgetown, th these are all kind of like wonderful uh, multifaceted courses. Um, bottom line, how do you assess the students? Uh, product, process, holistic, meta, and I'm just curious, and balancing those different goals. I think this will probably be the last question, looking at the clock, and it's Sam Jackson from Georgetown. Right? Uh, and the question is, how do we engage student assessment, uh, determine that they're doing a good job grading and so on, and you know, how can we be specific? Um, I, I'll start very quickly because we have very limited time. Uh, that's a great question for which we have too little. Uh, the answer is it's a, an extraordinarily subjective thing. The fewer students you have, you're, you're comparing, you're ha having teams compete against one another. Uh, sometimes in the last assignment in my course, half the teams are doing a landlord-oriented assignment, the other half are doing a tenant-oriented assignment. Uh, I only assess work, written work product. That's the first thing. I do no participation. And it, I get tons of it anyway. The only product I care about is what would have, would have arrived in the mail had I been an attorney. I'm not standing there during their negotiations, although we talk about negotiation strategies um, and how successful they were. Um, I look at the quality of writing, number one, whether they address the issues, because I asked for specific, to, um, to, to address specific issues, concerns of the clients, whether they were specifically addressed in their work product. Um, and I look for the typical drafting errors, such as allowing more than one reading a provision which ultimately makes no sense, uh, modifying the wrong part of a lease document, uh, incorporating the long, wrong language, eliminating a definition that should have been there. You know, there are many things you can look for to make sure that the work product is good. And finally, we all know that certain documents need a certain structure. And by the end of the semester, they know what that structure should be. And so I look to see how, how for lack of a better word, how elegant it is. Does it look right? But in the end, it's very subjective. I would say uh, it's incredibly subjective. I look at everything. They don't get a letter grade for any one individual assignment. But what I have them do, and it's actually been pretty successful, is I have them fill out a fairly lengthy self-evaluation form. And then during finals, we meet. And we have a half an hour discussion of how they think their skills have developed, um, what they think their best written work product was. And I also, I ask them that hard grade, what do you think I should give you? And they've seen, and oh my god, the looks on their faces when they ask that. It's just really fun in an evil kind of way. Um, but I found that if they're really starting to learn what I want them to learn, meaning how to assess their work and how to view their peer work and look at their peers and measure themselves against their peers, they're going to be pretty good in assessing the grade that I will give them. And 90 time, probably 90% of the time, they will tell me the grade that I would have picked for them. And that's when I know that they're really getting good at understanding and assessing their own work and that of their peers. But it's actually, it's about a three-page uh, form. If anybody wants it, I'm happy to email it to you. <coughs> Just give me your business card after and I'll shoot it off. Thank you.